Okay, so let's finish up where we were in class today. Sorry about uh, running a tiny bit late and not quite finishing where we were. Remember what we were talking about was the change in potential between two points as we move away from a, um, a line of positive charge. Or not, not even a line of positive charge, it's a line of charge with charge density lambda. So if lambda is negative, then it's a line of negative charge. Um, and so what we found is as we go from some initial radius to some final radius uh, that we have uh, that that we have the change in potential between those two points is minus lambda over two pi epsilon zero and the integral was one that some of you hadn't seen before but most of you have uh, ended up being the natural log and when we're evaluating evaluating uh, the integral at its limits we therefore get the natural log at the top limit minus the natural log at the bottom limit. And then I want to remind you of a little bit of mathematics that you should know. That the natural log of one number minus another number, I'm gonna go over to the next page and there's gonna be a lot of equations there already. The natural log of one number minus another number, so we're here, um, is not equal to the natural log of RF minus RI. If the natural log of RF minus the natural log of RI is not equal to that, but it turns out, and we won't go through why this is the case, but it, it comes from the definition of natural log, that the natural log of RF minus the natural log of RI is the natural log of RF divided by RI. So the end result is, is right here. Uh, the change in potential between those two points is given as this function. And remember, while this picture is not fantastic, we're talking about um, uh, moving between two points. It doesn't have to be a plus charge moving between two points because of the change in potential between two points. So you don't need a charge there. If I wanted to know then what is the change in potential energy, right, then the change in potential energy is equal to Q delta V if I'm moving a charge between those two points. A positive charge is gonna to move to a lower potential energy. A negative charge is gonna to move to a lower potential energy um, but, uh, oh, sorry, a negative charge is actually going to move inward instead of outward, um, which is going to be to a higher potential, but to a lower potential energy. In any case, we were calculating the potential difference between two points near a line of charge, and here we have it. So here's a summary of what we've done, right? The definition of the change in potential is minus the integral of E dot ds, and then we calculated the potential for a point charge, where we actually define the potential equals zero to r equals infinity. For the other two special ex cases, we don't have to define v equals zero anywhere. Uh, we so the first one is the potential uh, of a point charge. Then we've got the potential in a, the change of potential in a constant field and the change of potential for a line. We had said when we started this that we were going to talk about these three special cases, um, and so these are the three special cases of potential at a point. And then you can use the potential, of course, when you put a charge in the field to find the ch change in potential energy when a charge moves from one point to another. Change in potential energy is Q delta V. And then we can do energy conservation problems. We can figure out where charges move in fields, etc. Let me just show you one more mathematical um, fact. I don't want to call it a trick uh, because often you won't see the negative sign uh, on the line of charge, and that's because that's because of the properties of the natural log. Right? The, 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 look at the second line here. That the natural log of a number is equal to, I'm sorry, the minus natural log of the number is the same as the natural log of the number to the negative one. That's a property of natural logs. It's a mathematical property. So what you end up with is that the change of potential energy when we move from some initial radius to some final radius near a line of charge is equal to lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0, natural log of Ri over Rf. Right, so we just invert the Ri and Rf, and so now, there's, and now it's a positive number. So don't be confused when you sometimes see it as positive, sometimes see it as negative. Um, this is uh, it's just the property of natural logs. Um, but also remember that for any one of these th three special case formulas or any potential that you find, you can always just calculate the absolute value of it. So don't worry about the sign and then figure out 
from the situation, whether it should be less getting smaller or getting bigger, whether you should put a negative sign in front of it or a positive sign in front of it, you can do that qualitatively. If the potential is going down, then delta V better be negative. If the potential is going up, then delta V better be positive because delta V means V final minus V initial. So you don't even have to worry about the sign. You can always figure it out qualitatively. Now let's just do another quick example. Um, the Earth's electric field, sorry, the Earth has an electric field. Uh, we think of the Earth as being neutral and we treat it like it's being neutral, but it isn't actually neutral. The Earth is actually slightly negatively charged. And the ionosphere, um, the uh, outside of the atmosphere, uh, is, is positively charged. And so there's actually an electric field pointing downwards near the surface of the Earth. And it is approximately, it's approximately downwards. It's not exactly downwards. It's approximately downwards and it depends where you are on Earth. Um, and it is approximately equal to 150 newtons per coulomb. So assuming that the electric field is approximately constant and downwards, through what uh, displacement would you have to move uh, in the Earth's atmosphere to have a 9 volt potential difference equivalent to a 9 volt battery? So this should be becoming second nature to you at this point. This is a constant field and we already know that the potential difference in a constant field is equal to minus E delta Y, where delta Y is the direction of the field, or it's the absolute value of E delta Y, and then we can figure out the sign later. I'm just gonna, let's just figure out the magnitude. Um, so if we want delta V to be nine volts, just gonna plug in some numbers. Nine volts is 150 newtons per coulomb times delta Y. So delta Y, do the math, is 0 0.06 meters. How do I know it's meters? Because all of these numbers are in MKS, um, and uh, the, other, the, the other unit of electric field, electric field is newtons per coulomb. It's also volts per meter. So we can see that delta Y is 0 0.06 meters or 6 centimeters. So you get a 9 volt potential difference when you move um, 6 centimeters uh, along this, uh, in one direction, either along or anti-parallel to this electric field. So now which direction? So we asked for what the potential difference was to get a plus nine volt um, potential difference. And so which direction is it? The direction is, you tell me. Okay, the direction is up, right? Because the potential is gonna go down along the field lines. So as you go up from the Earth's surface, your potential has to get larger. So nine volts, zero volts. Well, that's the I mean, not uh, difference of nine volts. Delta V is nine volts. And you can define your zero wherever you want in a constant field. Um, so it's up six centimeters. So then the next question is how much work is done by the electric field when an electron moves through, the, through this displacement. Let's say that I put an electron, I, I have an electron and I just let it go and it's going to move, theoretically, uh, at least ignoring gravity, ignoring gravity. Uh, let's say that the electron moves, um, it's gonna move away from the Earth's surface because the Earth's surface is negatively charged, it's gonna move upwards towards the ionosphere. And when it moves through this distance of six centimeters, it moves through that distance because the electric field did work on it and how much work did the electric field do? You need to remember that work is minus the change in potential energy. So all we gotta do is find the change in potential energy. The change in potential energy is Q delta V. So the work is minus Q delta V. And so the work is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times nine volts. But wait a second, I wanna take this opportunity to talk about a different unit. Let me cross this out. I'm still asking for the work that it takes to move an electron, which has a charge of minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, or minus E, remember E, the definition of E is positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So the charge of an electron is minus E. 
Okay, so I rewrote it over here. Now the charge of an electron is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, which is defined as minus E, where E is defined as plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. There's a reason for doing this, which is that we can write the work done in terms of the charge of the electron, or the, the, the natural unit of charge E, instead of writing it in terms of, of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So I just plugged in the charge of the electron is minus E, Notice the minus signs cancel, so we got plus E times 9 volts, which we write as plus 9 EV. We say the work is plus 9 EV, or 9 electron volts. EV is a unit of energy. It's a unit of energy. It's not an MKS unit, right? The MKS unit is joules, but the MKS unit of energy, which is the fundamental charge of the electron times volt, which is a unit of energy. Now, does the plus sign make sense? Does it make sense that the work done by the electric field is positive, or should the work done by the negative of the electric field have been negative? But the electric field is what is, uh, if the, the electron was moving because it's being pushed by the electric field, so if the force is in the same direction as the displacement, then the plus, the work for plus, uh, work being positive is correct. And the unit EV, the unit EV is an important unit. We use it in, in, in energy all the time for it's particularly small, um, for particularly small energies and energies on the atomic level, right? So what is the unit, the unit, 1 EV, well the unit 1 EV is 1 times, I'm sorry, try again, 1 EV is 1, oh well times, yeah, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times volts. So 1 EV, right, there's no, no negatives are here, right? This is just the E, the fundamental unit of charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So it's 1 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times volts. So 1 EV is 1.6 times 10, 10 to the minus 19 joules. And EV is just a very small amount of energy. So this is a unit, right? This is a unit conversion. 1 EV is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules of energy. It's convenient because if we're talking about charges, uh, if we're talking about charged objects that have charges of, uh, you know, a, a couple of, that are equivalent to a couple of electrons um, or a couple of protons, um, then it's just, a, it's a convenient unit uh, to use. It's a natural unit to use. So let's just talk, let me talk a tiny bit more about this unit. Let's just take a mass. So forget charges. The unit has nothing to do with charges. Um, it's just a unit of energy. So let's have a mass, one kilogram. Let's say that we hold that mass above a table, above a table surface by one meter. Um, and we ask, what is the potential energy of this mass? What is the gravitational potential energy? Well, you know that the gravitational potential energy is mgh, which is one kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared times one meter, that's the potential energy of this mass, so it's 9.8 joules. So how many electron volts is that, right? Mu G, uh, sorry, the potential energy due to gravity is 9.8 joules. We multiply it by the unit conversion, one EV over 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And so the amount of energy, uh, potential energy that this mass has is do the math, 6.125 times 10 to the positive 19 EVs, right? It's a lot of electron volts, a lot of electron volts. Um, so electron volts are a small unit of energy. Joule is a larger unit of energy. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, two more things in this chapter. One is I wanna talk about um, how to calculate the electric field from a potential, right? We figured out how to calculate a potential from an electric field, but how do you go the other way? And then I want to talk about equipotential surfaces. So it's just a couple of real quick concepts, and then we're going to move on or back to capacitors. Okay, so the last of the elephant jokes, and then we'll move on to something else. So there's a couple of them. So how many elephants can you fit in a Mini Cooper? Four, two in the front, two in the back. How do you know if there's an elephant in the refrigerator? There are footprints in the butter. How do you know if there are two elephants in the refrigerator? You can hear them giggling. How do you know if there are three elephants in the refrigerator? The door doesn't shut quite right. 
And how do you know if there are four elephants in the refrigerator? There's a Mini Cooper parked out front. Okay, let's say goodbye to the elephants. Okay, back to calculating electric field from delta V. If you understand Calc 3, you can do this, no problem. If you don't understand Calc 3, don't worry about it. We'll get to the result. Don't worry too much about the how we get there, but let's follow along. Okay, so let me rewrite the equation delta V is minus E dot DS. Remember, this is an arbitrary electric field now for an arbitrary potential difference, so uh, dot product doesn't go away or anything. So let me just write E dot DS in a slightly different way. Right, so DS is an arbitrary position vector which has an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. So we can rewrite uh, E dot DS in the following way. Again, DS is just an arbitrary uh, uh, not position vector, but displacement vector, arbitrary displacement vector, ds, and it's got, it's, got, it's got three components, right? It's got an x component, y component, z component, so ds can be written as, as you see there. And e has three components. e can be written as ex in the i direction plus ey in the j direction plus ek in the, oops, ez, in the k direction. And so if we combine these two things, E and DS, and we do that dot product out, remember a dot product in general, you're gonna get the X components multiplied together plus the Y components multiplied together plus the Z components multiplied together. In general, right, A dot B is equal to AX BX plus AY BY plus a, Z, B, Z. Whoops, that got messy quickly. A, Z, B, Z. That's, that comes from the definition of the dot product. So delta V can be written as this. So we've gotten rid of the dot product. And so now, I, so now we've got three components of electric field, right? Again, this is an arbitrary electric field and some arbitrary potential. Um, so it's got three components in three dimensions. Um, and in general, we can then say that if Delta V is the integral of E dot E. Sorry, if delta V is the integral of E times a uh, displacement vector, then E is the derivative of delta V with respect to the displacement vector. Right? It's the antiderivative. But we're in three dimensions here, so we've got to do three antiderivatives. And so what we've got is E x is equal to dV dx, and E oh man. I'm sure you all noticed that I dropped my negative sign from the previous page. Negative sign, negative sign, negative sign. Drop my negative sign. So EX is dV dx, and EY is, oops, sorry, minus dV dy, and EZ is minus dV dz. Now, you might say, what is that funny D? This is a derivative, but it's called a partial derivative. You all probably should have seen partial derivatives, but it's really a very simple concept. The partial derivative means, let's say, let's take this one for example. It means take the derivative of V with respect to X and pretend everything else is a constant. While our, our um, variables here are x, y, and z, we're gonna just take the derivative of v with respect to x and hold everything else constant. This means take the derivative of v with respect to y, hold everything else constant. This means take the derivative with respect to z, hold everything else constant. So we can, if we know how v, um, uh, what v's dependence on x, y, and z is, we can calculate the x, y, and z components of electric field. For example, let's just say we've got some arbitrary potential. Who knows who, what's created this potential? Some storm of charges has created this potential. But we've got this arbitrary potential that varies both in the x and the y direction, in, let's say in a plane, right? Then the electric field, E sub x, is minus dV dx. That just means take the derivative minus, take the derivative with respect to x and pretend y is a constant. So the derivative with respect to x gives us 6x. And the y component, oops, I keep dropping my minus sign, minus 6x. And the y component is minus 2, right? The derivative with respect to y. 
Z component, what is it? Zero. So the electric field due to this potential is minus 6x in the i direction, minus 2 in the j direction, plus 0 in the z direction. So that's how to calculate electric fields from arbitrary potentials. Let's do another simple example. Take a, a situation that you are now familiar with. Let's talk about a, um, a sheet of charge. Let's just make it a positive sheet of charge so that the electric field points away. Call up the plus y direction. We know that delta V is minus E delta Y. We can define um, our V equals zero anywhere we want. So let's just say V equals uh, zero at y equals zero. So V is equal to minus E Y. Right, so that's just for a sheet of charge. We already knew that. And so, therefore, E sub x is dv minus dv dx, which is the derivative of minus ey dx, which is 0. E sub y is the derivative minus the derivative of minus ey dy, which take that derivative, minus sign comes out, it is just e, and e sub z is zero again. So the electric field is e. Well, we already knew that, right? The electric field was e. The magnitude of the electric field was e. Um, the electric field here is actually, it tells us more than the magnitude is e, it says that it's e in the j direction because it was e sub y that was e. So there you go, electric field from potentials. Equipotential surfaces helps you to visualize the energy, not energy field, there's no such thing as an energy field, but the, the energy of the, the, due to the electric field around charged objects. So this concept of equipotential surface is important both qualitatively and quantitatively uh, to be able to, um, sometimes to be able to understand what's going on or to calculate things. But let's just go, go straight to the concept of equipotential surface. Equipotential means equal potential, right? So an equipotential surface is the surface around a charge distribution over which the potential is equal. It doesn't change. So let's remember what the electric field map looks like for a sphere of charge or a point charge, right? So this is the electric field map, and the, and, and the density of the lines and direction of the lines mean something. So the question is, is where, what is, where is, if I, if I say, if I uh, put down my pencil somewhere and say, okay, the potential at this, whoops, there, let's make a dot. I hope you see that red dot. Okay, the potential at that point is X, whatever it is, it's 17 volts. Where else is the potential equal to 17 volts? Is it equal to 17 volts here? No, because we moved along a field line, so we've gone down in potential. Is it equal to 17 volts here? No, because we've got moved anti-parallel to a, a, a field line, so we've gone up in potential. Where is it equal to 17 volts? You know, right? It's equal to 17 volts at the same distance away anywhere around this sphere of charge. So the equipotential surface is, remember this is three dimensions, so the equipotential surface is a spherical shell. Right? So anywhere on that spherical shell, the potential is the same. If the potential was 17 volts where I started, then it's 17 volts anywhere on that spherical shell. So that is an equipotential surface. So I've drawn another equipotential surface, right? At that point, whatever the potential is, say it's 2 volts, then the surface anywhere on that surface is 2 volts. So what can we say about what, what qualities do equipotential surfaces have? Well, first of all, if I've got a charge on an equi if I've got a charge anywhere, it doesn't have to be on, it's always going to be on some equipotential surface. But if I've got a charge, let's put a charge down. Let's put a charge right here, plus Q, some test charge. And it's on that surface. It's just an, it's, an, it's an imaginary surface, right? But it's on that surface. If I move the charge anywhere along that surface, so let's say I just move the charge along that surface. How much work is done by the electric field? Think about it. How much work is done by the electric field? 
None, right? No work is done by electric field because I haven't moved along the electric field line. I haven't moved to a different potential. The potential is the same. So the electric field does no work when you move a, a, along an equipotential surface. What's another property of an equipotential surface? Clearly, if you think about it, equipotential surfaces must always be perpendicular to field lines. Because if you move along a field line, it does work. The potential changes. But if you move perpendicular to a field line, then the field can do no work and the potential doesn't change. So equipotential surfaces are perpendicular to field lines. So the concept here is if I take a char my charge plus Q, which I put down on the surface and I move it along the surface, the energy of the charge doesn't change. But if I move it between equipotential surfaces, which there are, there are an infinity of them, right? But we can draw a map just by showing a couple of them. Then the, the, the energy of that charge changes. So what do equipotential surfaces look like for our different configurations of charges, the symmetrical configuration of charges? So first, let's remember to, uh, what the fields look like for our different co configuration of charges. A point charge, the field is spherically outward. For the line of charge, the field is cylindrically outward. For the plane of charge, the field is constant and uh, straight up or, or down. Whoops, I didn't draw it below the plane. So what would the uh, equipotential surfaces look like? Imagine, think about what over what surface would the potential not change for each of these configurations. So in purple, I've drawn the equipotential surfaces, right? For a point charge, a sphere of charge, there's spheres. For a um, line of charge, there's cylinders. For a plane of charge or in a constant field, they gotta be planes perpendicular to the field. So those are the uh, equipotential surfaces. So this concept of equipotential surface has an interesting result for uh, conductors, any arbitrary conductor, right? Because remember that at this, that that if you have an, a conduct a charged conductor outside the conductor, you've got some potential that increases as you get closer to the surface of the conductor, and at the surface. It's a value which then doesn't change when you get inside the conductor. It's what we talked about a couple of days ago. So this can be extended to understand that any contiguous conductor, doesn't matter what shape it is, doesn't matter what shape it is, inside the conductor has to be a constant electric, uh, sorry, has to be a constant uh, potential because the electric field is zero inside the conductor. That means that the surface of the conductor must also be a constant potential. So the surface of any conductor, regardless of shape, is an equipotential surface. The surface of any conductor is an equipotential surface. So this can tell us about how charges distribute when we, uh, when we have, let's say, for example, two conductors in contact with each other. This can tell us information about it. Let's say I have two conducting spheres. One has a charge, a total charge of plus Q1 and a radius of R1, and the other has a total charge of plus Q2 and a radius R2, and these are solid conducting spheres. Okay, let's take a particular situation here where let's say um, R1, I'm just making this up, R1 equals 2R2, and let's say Q1 equals, let's just say that, say that they start with the same charge on their surfaces, so that Q1 is equal to Q2. Let's then bring the two spheres into contact with each other and allow the charges to redistribute. The two spheres are going to be in contact with each other, and the charge is going to redistribute. Why will the charge redistribute? Because it's got to be the same at the same potential. All charges are going to move to where they're at the same potential, so that they can't go to any lower potential. I don't know if that really made sense, but they, 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 it's going to, they're going to move until the two surfaces are the same potential because the two surfaces are in contact with each other. So that means the potential of sphere one must equal the potential of sphere two. I bring them in contact with each other, and then I remove them from each other. Okay, I've annotated this a little bit. Now I'm gonna separate the two spheres and ask how much charge is on each sphere. So here's the situation, I've separated them. I, they have new charges, so I'm gonna call Q1 prime and Q2 prime for after 
they've, they've been in contact, and ask how much charge is on each sphere. Well, the point here is that they have to now be at the same potential. Because they were attached, they have to be now at the same potential. We could do The, the other way we could do this is just to, is to never have touched them, but just to have a wire go between them, attach them with a wire. That's going to bring them to the same potential because now they're a continuous conductor. They've got to be at the same potential. And so now, uh, because they're at the same potential, the potential of sphere one, which is going to be K Q1 prime over R1, must equal the potential of sphere two, which is K Q2, whoops, Q2 prime over R2, because that's the potential at the surface of a sphere that we figured out long ago. So let's go ahead and solve that to figure out what the relationship between the char new charges is. Right, so we just set them equal to each other. Solve for Q1 over Q2, Q1 prime over Q2 prime equals R1 over R2. Uh, because they're fat, we told you that R1 is 2R2. That means that Q1 prime over Q2 prime is two. That means that Q1 Q1 prime is now 2Q2 prime. Remember, initially they were the same charge. Now one's twice the other. You might ask, wait, how does that work? Where did the extra charge come from? There's no extra charge here, right? It redistributed where it was originally equal. Now one's twice the other. So just make sure, make sure you understand that. Let's think about some numbers. If each sphere originally had, let's say, three microcoulombs of charge on it, right? Three on Three microcoulombs on sphere R1, three microcoulombs on sphere R2, the charges were equal. Now, one is twice the other, but we still have to have the same total charge, right? There were six microcoulombs, so now Q1 is gonna be two microcoulombs, I'm sorry, Q2 is gonna be two microcoulombs, and Q1 is gonna be four microcoulombs. Let me write that out. So here it is written out. If Q1 equals Q2, then there's, uh, and there are each three microcoulombs, you have a total of six microcoulombs. Now the redistribution is that Q1 is twice Q2, so that means one has four, the other has two. You can solve that algebraically. And remember that the point here is that conductors, that, the, that a surface, of, actually throughout an entire conductor, the potential is the same everywhere. On, therefore, anywhere on the surface is the same everywhere. Doesn't matter what shape it is. So if you attach two conductors together, they must be at the same potential on their surfaces and at their interiors. So can you move two matchsticks to get the largest number possible? In other words, move two matchsticks, and how big a number can you get? Largest number possible is what we're looking for. I'm going to write the solution soon, so pause it if you, don't, if you want to think about it. Okay, I'm gonna move these two matchsticks as shown. I don't know if you can tell what you're gonna get, but you probably should have guessed that the largest number you can get is the largest number you can get with three numbers, and that's 999. And here is a giant ball of matchsticks on fire. 